If I could pick who I wanted to be when I grow up, I'd choose Jade Electra. And not just because I always wish to be a stunning and statuesque black woman who rips the roof off every time she sings, or because she's a well-loved recording star with such hits as, bitch, you look fierce. Why are you gagging? Reading glasses? And HIV Vogue, which she recorded to raise money to fight AIDS and help raise awareness to go with the art of her husband, John Allen. Yeah, all of which you can see on YouTube. It's not even because she is a New York show by legend, does a near perfect Billie Holiday, and has an extensive list of television and film credits, including to Wong Fu and Stonewall. No, the real reason I want to be Jade Electra is a wardrobe. <laughs> I mean, it's completely to die for. But don't take my word for it. Check it out. Kevin came from Miami, FLA. Hitchhiked his way across the USA. Plucked his eyebrows along the way, shaved his legs, and now he was a she. She said, hey, babe, take a walk on the wild side. I said, hey, honey, take a walk on the wild side. Hey, babe, take a walk on the wild side. I said, hey, honey, take a walk Ever on the wild side. I was side. really small. All right. Uh, I was always mistaken for a girl when I was braids, like uh, cornrows. So, like, people would always go, oh, what a cute little girl. And, weirdly enough, my grandmother never corrected them. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, my, I, I guess my identity started then, when I started thinking about what feminine was, or whatever. You know, there are so many people who do drag for different reasons. And there are the, um, you know, that's where you start getting into the cross-dresser, the performer, the transsexual, there are, you know, there are different things. I am a stage performer, so my makeup is not made for women. It's made for the stage. So I, I do my makeup as though I'm going to be on stage. I never worry about trying to pass in daylight and all that other stuff. So, you know, my objective is completely different than someone who, like, is a cross-dresser or a, uh, a transsexual who lives as a woman. I'm a jeans and t-shirt kind of person, so I don't, you know, and during the winter, a sweatshirt and a jacket. That's it. I don't need any extra. I don't need, you know, jump in the shower, get out, dry off, put on my clothes, leave. I don't need you know, too much. If I had to do drag every day, I probably would not want to do it and probably wouldn't want to be a performer. In the South, um, when I was coming up, um, that was the thing, was that, like, they automatically assumed that you were going to go that route. You were going to be a transsexual, you were going to um, be, you know, you were going to be a woman. And uh, when I decided that I wasn't going to go that route, and, because when I first started doing drag, a lot of bars and people were like, oh my god, we'll sponsor you. This is back in Florida. And drag is so different down there. Like in the South, it's like a religion. And they really, they really love their drag queens and they will support them to the end. And so once you start it, they want to make you, you know, into this woman. They, like whatever character you create, that's what they're willing to help you create. And uh, I just wanted to do the shows. I didn't want to do any augmentation or put in breasts and all that other stuff. So once they figured that out, I sort of kind of got blacklisted for not being a, a transsexual because um, I wasn't going to do all that stuff. And it was it was weird. It was really kind of weird how I was the up-and-coming performer and then when they realized I wasn't going to go that out, then suddenly I was like a pariah, like, oh, no, 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 don't work with her. So, sure. Um, I, I had a couple of friends, um, like I had a, a roommate back in the 80s who showed me how to do my makeup, and he was really good. His name was Rick Fournier. And, uh, but like, you know, the, the best way to learn is to actually just take some time and sit in a mirror, get a bunch of magazines, and find a look that you like and see if you can recreate it. 
you know, look at the colors, look at where they are, and see if you can try and apply it that way. And the more you do it, the better you get at it, you know. And everybody has their own way of doing their makeup. Some people, you know, I know, it, like, mine, I almost feel like it's a stencil. Like, I know exactly where I'm supposed to go and how much I'm supposed to put on and all this stuff. So I've been doing the contouring and all that stuff for years. The only thing that changes from time to time is, are the colors for the eyeshadow. Because I might want to go for a brighter color or a more dramatic look. But for the most part, I generally kind of keep my makeup the same. And that way, it's consistent. I mean, when I'm in drag, I always feel like I'm the same person. However, I do know that there are some characteristics and things that I do that just come naturally once I get everything on. Uh, I don't really feel like I'm in complete jade mode until I have my earrings on. To me, that's the finishing touch, and that actually kind of seals it and lets me see exactly the balance of what I did with my makeup and everything else. A lot of people are probably going to feel really uncomfortable about this, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, because of it's a, it's a very important part of my life, even though it's not a very nice thing that happened. I was molested as a child uh, by an uncle. And he recognized in me early on that I liked feminine things and that I enjoyed, like when I was a kid, I would run and go and grab my grandmother's wigs and put them on and we would do little shows for the family. I was the first one to play the girl part. Uh, and so he kind of tapped into that. And unfortunately, in the molestation, he degraded me about being feminine. And I went, you know... It was a, a long process. I went through therapy about it. I talked about what it was for me. Why did I go in that direction? And it was because of I've never, to me, femininity and masculinity, they're concepts. These are things that people are taught. They're not real. We are all of those things at once. It's just what you decide to do when you walk out the door. It definitely was... An important part of the movement, obviously, with the Stonewall riots, because it was the drag queens who started the, mm -hmm. the fights with the cops. Um, you know, so it always cracks me up when I see these big burly guys, you know, like bitching about, like, oh, these effeminate guys, they're giving us a bad rap and blah, blah, blah. Well, it wasn't the big burly guys who started the fight with the cops, it was the, the drag queen with the purse. <laughs> who went out and fought with them first, and then you guys decided to join in. The biggest political uh, thing that you could do is go out and be yourself. So if this is a part of yourself, if this is really who you are or what you like to do, then this is like the best way to express yourself and let the world know that you are not afraid to be who you are. And definitely going out in public like this because it can be very dangerous. I get out of doing drag an expression of this is what I think pretty is. This is this is what I think a woman should feel like. Like how I feel when I'm in drag is what I think a woman should feel like. Although I don't know what a woman really does feel like, but that's what it means to me. RuPaul sa uh, says that um, you're born naked and the rest is drag. And that is true. That's the political statement that she said. Um, that is true. Uh, to me, whatever it is that you decide to put on after you are born, that's your drag. So it could be leather, it could be office drag, it could be anything, anything that you use to identify yourself with, that is drag. The way that television and everything is portraying gay now, kids are coming out a lot earlier, and they're given sort of a false security about coming out, that it's going to be okay because of it's all over television, blah, blah, blah. But the reality, you know, it's not the same as coming out in a big city or... You know, so you have a, a whole nother 
experience than what it would be like. I mean, in, in a big city, there are places for you to go and talk to people and get involved in some sort of community. But when you live in a smaller place, um, you know, you really actually need to be careful about who you talk to and who you tell, um, you know, because it's not going to be, you know, this big gay pride rally <laughs> that you think it's going to be. That comes later when, you know, you're older and you're making some bigger decisions for yourself. So, I, I follow the whole rule of Hollywood. A good red lipstick, a blood red, you can never go wrong. This is a very cheap lipstick. <laughs> but, as Tim on um, Project Runway says, I'm going to make it work. I find, especially being of the African American elk, um, that to get a wig to look a little better and a little more natural on a black girl, it is almost essential to let it get a little nappy for, I have, to, these are two wigs. So the one on top, I barely put any hairspray on, but the one on the bottom, I put a lot of hairspray in, so I let the hairspray, and it's always good to do this with um, an older wig and a new wig. So the one on top is a newer wig, the one on the bottom is an older wig. So I don't care if I fry it because of, I've already gotten most of the use out of it, I'm just using it for a hairline at the moment. So, and what you do is you take garbage bags, like or bags that you get from the store, and you crumble them up and you put them inside in between them. So that gives the, the lift. So you can probably hear that's the bags in there that's giving me the volume. Otherwise, this would be really flat on my head. And I'm giving away some major tricks of the trade here. <laughs> I need to plan out what it is that I'm doing. I want control over what time frame I'm working with, how I'm going to present myself. Just walking in and picking a number as the night goes, I can't do it. I need to plan out everything. I need to know what I'm going to do. Because as they teach you in acting class, there is freedom and structure. So if you have a structure to what it is that you're doing, then you have the freedom to do whatever it is that you want to do. I like, I like performing and um, I do like being on stage. But I want to make sure that I'm on stage for the right reason. I don't just want to be up there. You know, I want to make sure that I have something to say when I have everyone's attention. So, as I always say, my look is not complete until I put on earrings. So that's what I need to find, is the perfect earrings. stimulates me creatively and this is part of the reason uh, because I'm a playwright that I wanted to, to write for that character is that whenever I see uh, her perform I go back to the 50s in like a jazz club and I, I see her as, as a real woman of that, that time period. And that's the other thing I love about watching Jade is that, I mean as a lesbian, I can actually completely forget that Jade's a guy in a dress. 
because Jade Electra is one of the few drag queens that actually truly moves like a woman. Not like an exaggerated form of what guys think women are. So, just even the hands, everything, it's, uh, you know, the physicality is, is quite amazing. They're big hands, but they still move. <laughs> <laughs> no, but when you, when you walk across, when you are Jade, I really feel like you totally own a female body. I mean, like you, it's it's hard to explain, but if you watch other other drag performers, it's it's like uh, it's all about the boobs. It's but but it's you don't believe they're really their boobs. But Jade, actually, you feel like like what the body that she's got on stage is is really her physicality. Thanks. <laughs> Jade has an ability to to be completely down to earth and completely sort of mellow, but at the same time sort of stick a few jabs in and and tease lovingly, which is something that I love doing. And and sometimes I'm not so loving about the way I do it, but the way that Jade can sort of work a crowd and still be still be Jade and still be fun, and if there's somebody that's bringing an energy that isn't what she wants, she can still bring it around to, to this, this happy, mellow, fun place. I mean, aside from, you know, the obvious, you know, the, the voice and the personality. I was just, I'm, I'm assuming everybody else has talked about your beautiful voice and the, uh, and the, the, the impressions that you do. Your Billie Holiday is incredible. Um, I don't know, just the different characters that you play. My, my dad had come down here and has seen uh, seen me play here and I was saying you know it's gonna be a really good night um, you know Jade's doing a, uh, a birthday show I know it's gonna be good and my mom had been trying to, to find time to come down and um, it's like hey you know this would be a good this would be a good night to do it and so um, you know them coming down and they totally had a blast and uh, my dad, I think, still at the end of the night was going, that's not a dude. What? <laughs> and, then, and then going, dad, mm-hmm, yeah, it, yeah, he's, yeah, uh, Jade is Alfonso. <laughs> and, uh, and then sitting, uh, sit, my dad sitting at the bar next to Michelle. Mm-hmm. And, and um, them totally hitting it off and having, having a fun night. And, and again, same thing. No. No. <laughs> so, I, um, I could see Michelle. I can't see him looking at the six foot seven drag queen <laughs> thinking, no, that has to be a woman. That's crazy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> big, big power on stage. <laughs> If, you believe, if I believe it in my head, I guess that's what it, I put out. So. <laughs> As a young performer, it's really hard to start out because for me, I, haven't, I didn't go to theater school or anything like a lot of the other performers around here have. So without knowing where to, where to go, the shows like that give you somewhere and then you can build up a bit of a fan base and it's, it gives you some, it's a starting point, which is hard to find, especially in this this community, unless you have someone like Jade Alfonso <laughs> to, to, to give, you, give you a platform. He's not afraid to be who he is, and that's what he's taught me. It's just all about being who you are, listen to the music that you want to, listen to who you are inside, and just bring that out wherever you are, whether it be you as a man, you as a woman, and just anything in general. Jade, honey, darling, you're fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. On stage and off stage. And those eyes, absolutely fierce. Everything you're doing, keep doing it. Because it's amazing. And I love you dearly. And you're going to take over the world someday. And I'm going to be right there behind you. Oh, and those eyes that I mentioned, those eyes. <laughs> fabulous. Love you. Let's see. Last year, this time, you were ignoring calls from Madonna. Then you were trying to rescue your sister from falling houses and things. And last week you were feeling empty. And now you're just simply gagging. Why are you gagging? Why are you gagging? Why are you gagging, Mathy? Why are you gagging? Why are you gagging, Mathy? Why are you gagging? Your body gets used to 
used to them. So. Girl, I feel like I'm crushing you. She's a big fan of Paprika Jones, which you got. They haven't yeah. met Paprika yet. They it's will. It's a good thing. <laughs> you were here? She gets it. No, I'm Paprika Jones. She's That's from my the other projects. character. Yeah, she's I do. She's from the projects. <laughs> She can't all. find her baby daddy. Yeah, she, Paprika has two kids, and she don't know who her baby daddy is. Well, she knows one of them, because the other one's in jail. But um, but her little baby, um, Amnesia, that's her name, uh, she don't know who Amnesia's daddy is, so. Unfortunately. <laughs> she should be going around blaming people for things that they did not do. Why are you gagging, Mystique? Why are you gagging? I went into a Burger King on 6th Avenue in New York and there, um, there was a, a girl behind the counter and I went in and ordered my food and she was acting as though I was bothering her. <laughs> and so I, I, something said to have her read, or read your order back to you and she read it back to me and it was all wrong. And I was like, okay, I want to see your manager. And she was all like, what you want to see him for? And I was like, um... I just would like to speak to your manager. You don't need to see him. And so the manager heard us and came out and I said, look, um, I, I don't mean no disrespect, but could you take my order and I do not want her near my food. Why did I say that? This girl like went off. She was like, oh no, you didn't. <laughs> you don't be talking to me like that. You talk to your garbage -y friends like that, not me. Cause I'm a motherfucking lady. So, I just had to do something with that kid. <laughs> so rather than getting upset with her or whatever, I just took it and wrote a character and made it into a show. Bitch, you sound fierce. And when I say fierce, I don't mean as in Mariah Carey fierce. Let's just say you sound more like Jim Carrey. What, what is that smell? Oh. Is. is that poison? No, not the perfume, as in rat. How y'all doing? Woo! Okay, uh, I know y'all can make more noise than that. How you doing? I want, when I ask you a question, I want you to act like I gave you a hundred dollars, okay? Okay. How you doing? Right, 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 right. I have an idea. Let's take it to the runway, shall we? My recording career started, um, real, I, I had a friend, uh, a, a good friend named Calvin Roberts, uh, and we were talking one day on the phone and I was telling him about an event that happened at a bar where a queen fell off a speaker. And he thought it was really funny the way that I told him the story. So uh, he was like, we need to record that. So uh, I went to his place uh, and literally we recorded uh, a couple of tracks of me talking uh, and he put it to music and at that time in New York City there was a um, uh, like a, a new kind of style of uh, tracks that were coming out that were called bitch tracks and uh, so I kind of fell in that genre and uh, totally had no idea that these would end up becoming like underground classics for some people. I guess the funny thing about my bitch tracks compared to most bitch tracks is that my bitch tracks are actually making fun of the people who are in the scene, but no one ever got that. So when I say bitch you look fierce, I'm not really giving a compliment, even though on their terms, fierce is a good thing. If you listen to the song, listen to what I'm saying, I'm actually telling you the original meaning of fierce. Uh, but no one got the joke, so they, uh, they loved the song, they liked the beat, and they vogue to it. And most of the kids who listen to the songs, they don't even know the references that I make, like to um, Glenn Campbell or, um, who else is that? Well, uh, they knew who Naomi Campbell was and Jim Carrey. And, but, I mean, I, literally, I was making fun of the scene, but no one got it. <laughs> I were a woman. 
when I was a little kid. I, I got a huge black following because of, you know, I was new. I was the new black DJ. and uh, But in a way, it kind of counted against me because of if I tried to work any other place, they would be like, oh, no, he's a black DJ and he's going to bring in a black crowd. Uh, so it was, I couldn't make it over to uh, El Goya or Tracks. They wouldn't hire me because of I would be considered to be too black. In 90... Um, I had gotten an, uh, an audition for The Crying Game. Uh, they were already casting, even though it didn't come out until a year or so later. Uh, well, they had to make the movie, I guess. Uh, so they were looking for someone who looked pretty convincing in drag, but also could play a male part. And I went, and of course I didn't get it. <laughs> you know, uh, Jake Davis, and I think is his name, who got it. Uh, but that was my first trip to New York and uh, like was completely blown away by New York and I was like I really want to come back here one day and I didn't really think that I would ever, ever be able to do it because I was like oh it must be super expensive to live there and you know there's so many talented people and DJs and stuff like that I could never get work there so I, it never occurred to me that I would actually do it well um, 90 was a, a that 1990 was a, a, a a big year of all kinds of stuff happening to me, like going there for that audition, and I put together like all these shows for Renee's. Uh, so like I started being like a show director for different things, and uh, that was also the year that uh, I was diagnosed as being HIV positive. Once upon a time, there was a little queen who dreamed of being famous. At thirty something, she was discovered, and her career took off. Too bad 10 years later, her tea would spoil it all. You better tell it. Those were some really painful times between being teased and, and all that stuff, but really figuring out a way to survive all that. And my mechanism was to make them like me. I was going to make them like me somehow, some way. And when I got the job at the Tampa Tribune, that was my end because I got to, um, I, I got more information than most kids my age had. So I'm 11 years old and I started working at the Tampa Tribune. I read once that someone says that, uh, someone wrote that it, it's you have two strikes against you if you're gay, first that you're black and then that you're gay. Uh, Cause you're sort of kind of on the lowest totem, but you're the lowest point on the totem pole. Um, 
I have had, like, some... I probably have had more problems being black than I have been being gay. As far as, like, racism, I've had, you know, I've not gotten jobs because of it, uh, being black. I've, uh, I've had uh, a bottle thrown at me on the side of the road while walking down the street and someone yelling out the window, nigger. Um, one of the earliest things that I remember about uh, racism was watching my grandmother get spit on uh, in a grocery store because this woman wanted to cut her in line. And my grandmother, because she was from Savannah, Georgia, like the way she was raised, you did not say anything bad to a white person. You didn't, so she couldn't do anything. And she just, I remember the look on her face and how mad she was, but how, I, like, that must have been a really, really horrible moment for her. I've never forgotten that look on her face. And, and also thinking to myself that this is what life is, that, like, you know, the strange thing for, like, a kid of, like, six to have to witness and process. Oh, really, darling? The title of this track is Riff. Reading is fundamental. Darling, you could never come for me when the extent of your travel is from the Bronx to Manhattan. Because you see, while I'm dining in Greece, you'll be frying your pork chops in Greece. Canola oil, to be exact. I mean, look at you. Need I say more? Riff. That's riff. Um, it was 1990, uh, and um, I had just gotten back from uh, auditioning for The Crying Game. So I had this wonderful trip to New York, and um, I, I just, I knew something was wrong. Um, like, I felt like something was wrong. And uh, I was living in this building, and John Dean uh, was one of my neighbors. And I have this, I still have the suit. It's this huge, huge suit. Uh, and uh, it's this gray suit. I have photos of it. Uh, I lent it to him, and I guess he didn't clean it or whatever. But uh, And he's probably going to hate me for saying this or whatever. But I, he had scabies. And uh, so it was on the suit, and I went to go do a show using it, and uh, I had scabies. And I went to go, I'd never had scabies before, so I went to the free clinic, and I'm like, something's wrong, I've been itching like crazy, I had this crazy rash, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, they looked at that, and, and they were like, well, look, while you're here, you should probably get tested. And at first I didn't want to do it, and, but like... I knew, something in the back of my mind knew that I was positive. Um, I just, something had been wrong for a while, like a few months. And I was just like, okay, I'll, I'll take the test. And um, I took, uh, you know, I took the test. And back then, it wasn't an immediate test. You had to wait two weeks to get the, the results. And I remember, like, dreading going to pick up the results. Um, they had prescribed something for me for the scabies, so I had to go get that, uh, stuff, and I was just getting settled in my new apartment in this building, and, uh, I had, a, uh, I was, I just got in cable, so I went, <laughs> I went to go pick up the results, and I remember the woman calling me into the office, and just, I, I was... I sat down, and I don't even remember what she said or whatever. All I know is I heard her say HIV positive. That's all I heard. She was talking to me, but that was the only thing that really registered. And and then, like, I kind of snapped out of it for a second. I was listening to her, and then she asked me if I was religious. And I said, not particularly. And she goes, well, you know, it might help to, like, maybe... To go back to the church or something and I was like wow and, you know because back then that meant uh, a death sentence like there wasn't the 
they, there weren't that many drugs and AZT was the only thing back then and that stuff killed you as well. I had a, I had some friends who were on it and it just, it ate you from the inside. It killed the virus, but it also killed you. So it was kind of like, and I swore I would never, ever get on that stuff if it happened to me. And uh, so I remember walking, but I was in such a daze and like numb almost from the news that I just started walking. And I, I had the results in my hand and I like, folded them up and put them in my pocket and I just started walking and I walked from the clinic, which was in downtown Tampa, over to Renee's, which was over on um, uh, Kennedy Boulevard. And I, I don't even know how far it was. It's probably a couple of miles or something. I don't know. And I got there, uh, and I got the results at probably like noon or a little afternoon. So I walked there, and I got there in the afternoon, and I I had these sets um, to do for the show. And I remember I did all of the sets that day. I sat and painted the skylines for. They were these big sheets of um, plywood, um, like panels or whatever, that I had to paint the skyline on and neon signs. And I did all of that in that one afternoon. And it was, it, it had gotten dark. It was way after like eight or something. And then I walked home from the bar, which wasn't that far. And I got in and I sat on my couch and I had. I, I just didn't know what to do or whatever. And I had just gotten cable, so I turned on the TV, and Steel Magnolias was on, and I had never seen it. So I start watching this, and, you know, by the time Shelby dies, I was bawling. Like, I was a wreck. And, uh... <laughs> I remember I said it like sobbing. I was I was like crying so hard um, that my nose started bleeding. Finding that out at that moment was, especially after coming back from New York, it seemed like everything was ruined. That I was not going to get to do the things that I wanted to do, and that I was, you know, I I, I almost felt like I had wasted all these years, you know, not doing the stuff that I wanted to do. So in a way, me finding out that I was positive was a catalyst for me to get up and go do the stuff that I wanted to do. So it actually motivated me to come to New York and it motivated me to go and try to do anything that I've always dreamed of. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is I am not RuPaul, but I think you know that. But I have brought you such hits such as Bitch You Look Fierce and Why Are You Gagging. Remember those? Bitch You Look Fierce. Why Are You Gagging? 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 Why Are You Gagging? Why Are You Gagging? April 30th, 2010, I got married to John Richard Allen, and um, uh, probably like one of the best days of my life. I think one of the things that uh, was really important about meeting him is, is that I've, I've always been out to all my close friends about being positive and stuff, but I've never been out, like publicly out. He is... Um, very out and very open about uh, his status and um, I really learned a lot of, uh, about the power of doing that um, because in my lifetime I think uh, everything that I've ever feared has already happened so me coming out officially like online and in public and like interviews and all that stuff has definitely like I guess made me fearless because there's nothing else for me to fear I don't I was afraid of be becoming positive while well, it happened uh, so and I'm still here so I'm not freaked out about that 
I was afraid about people finding out. Well, I'm telling everyone now, and I'm still here. <laughs> and there are still people in my life, and there are still people who love me, and I still, I actually found someone who loves me uh, and accepts it. Uh, and that's, that's amazing. I would like Jade to be a spokesperson for um, HIV activism. A friend of mine asked me once what I thought success was, and I said that um, success is being able to have $20 in your pocket after you've paid all your bills. Have $20 to go buy or do whatever you want with. That's my success. I've never really wanted anything more than that. And it would be great to be rich. It would be great to have, you know, a fabulous apartment and all that stuff. But the idea of actually being able to pay all my bills and still have a $20 bill to go and do whatever I wanted with, that was it. And coming to New York and like struggling, trust me, I struggled um, those early years um, with crappy jobs and real shitty apartments. Uh, you know, today that I'm still here and uh, looking back over the things that I've gotten to do and Mind you, I've never considered myself to be successful. I'm not a successful uh, recording artist or anything like that. I'm not on everyone's charts, and I'm not, um, you know, I'm not the, the the RuPaul's or the Lady Bunnies or any of those people when it comes to drag. Um, but I've gotten to do some amazing things. I've been on television. I've been. In movies, I've traveled. I've, uh, you know, I've <laughs> I've met some amazing people along the way. I've been in love several times. Uh, uh, that's successful to me. If my life ended tomorrow, um, I could not say that I didn't live a full life or a rich life because, in my opinion, I have. Uh, and it had nothing to do with money. It just, just the idea that I actually got up and I re really went and did the things that I wanted to do. That's great. That is so wonderful to look back and think that all those times of me sitting in my bedroom practicing with those crappy turntables and the little mixer. Uh, that like today I actually am spinning in other countries and um, you know I have people who download my music and my mixes on the internet from around the world when I was a kid me being in that lot across the street from my grandmother's house pretending to be a singer or a star and in my own little fantasy world at the age of seven and eight, like pretending that I was in front of a camera, uh, to think that I actually grew up and really did get in front of a camera. It's amazing. It, it, it really is amazing that I actually did do those things. So I can't complain. I really can't. I'm so in love with you Whatever you want to do Is alright with me Let me be the one you come running to I want to speak 
spend my whole life with you Let me say since, baby Since we've been together I'm loving you forever Is all right with me Cause you make me feel so brand new And I want to spend my whole life with you And what I want to say is let's, let's stay together Now, I didn't hear y'all that time. So when it comes up again, I want to hear y'all, right? I know you know the words. Well, the times are good or bad, happy or sad. Why? Why do people break up? All then turn around and make up. I just can't conceive Cause you never do that to me Would you, baby? Cause being around you is all I see And what I wanna say is Yeah.